His word this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. If you have your Bibles open and ready, please follow along in whatever translation you're using. We're using the English Standard Version. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from many, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and the place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, as we continue on our Easter sermon series entitled The Best News Ever, the best news ever here condensed in these very few short verses in this passage from John chapter 20. And as we... Um, uh, as, as I read through the different commentaries and articles and sermons in preparation, one thing became very, very clear in this, and that is that John is very, very selective in the stories that he presents to us in his gospel. In fact, if you took the gospel of John and simply laid it out on a calendar, John describes for us in the three years of Jesus' ministry, he describes for us 21 days maybe 22, depending upon how you take something, but 21 days out of Jesus' ministry is recorded for us in the Gospel of John. So it's no wonder that at the end of our passage this morning, John tells us, now there were many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. There are lots of other things that happened that I'm not writing about. I'm just taking these 21 days and condensing them down for you in this Gospel. And in this passage this morning, all of the commentators seem to agree that this is the climax, this is the high point, this is the main point of John's gospel that we get this morning in this story. Because in the gospel of John, we see many different themes like gifts of the Spirit, signs, witness, bearing faith, the I am statements, and they're all here in this story this morning. They're all here to be found in this story that we typically call Doubting Thomas and the story of Doubting Thomas. And in this story, as we look at it this morning and as we think about the situation that we're in, it's been made easy for us this morning, or at least it was made easy for me when I gave it all C's. This sermon is all about the letter C. If we were Sesame Street, this sermon would be brought to you this morning by the letter C. And we start first off with confusion slash chaos. 
this is not just something the disciples faced by themselves that we read about this morning. For we know that Mary Magdalene was confused at the tomb. In fact, she asked Jesus, confusing him to be the gardener, where have you taken him? The other women at the tomb were sort of confused about this whole situation. And remember, when the angel of the Lord appears, what does he say? Do not be afraid. Do not be confused. Do not be caught up in the chaos. The road to Emmaus. Indeed, the two that were traveling did not recognize Jesus and they were confused about what all of these things meant. His appearance to Peter and now to the ten, confusion and chaos reign. And this is the situation with which Jesus comes into. And as we look at verse 19, we are still on Easter we're still on the day that Jesus has risen from the dead. On that evening, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Confusion, chaos is reigning in their lives trying to figure out what all this means. Brothers and sisters, I can't help but read this and think about the confusion and chaos that we're in now in our culture. Do we go out? Do we stay in? Do we wear masks? How many times can I put uh, antibacterial Purell on my hands? How do I wash my hands? When do I go to the store? Will there be enough stuff there? Confusion and chaos reigns as we are locked in our houses, as it were, in our rooms. So our condition is not that much different from the disciples. And as Jesus appears, we need to hear these words, peace be with you. And then we get sort of in this story, we get duplicate stories, one dealing with the ten apostles who were there and then with Thomas, and it's sort of laid out in parallel tracks. As Jesus appears into this room, let it be known that he did so in not an earthly way. He didn't come in through the door. He didn't come through the window. It says that he appeared. The doors were locked. Jesus comes in in a supernatural way, ushering in the kingdom of heaven. The rules that uh, pertain to the earth don't pertain to the kingdom that comes. Jesus is appearing in physical form, but he doesn't need a door. He doesn't need a window. He doesn't need to be lowered down from the roof. He appears. This is a new situation. And as Jesus appears in this room, he can appear in your room right now. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can tell you he is. When two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus is there. That we can rest assured. And just as he begins to talk to the apostles this morning in our scriptures, he's talking to us. So let's keep that in mind as we look at moving from confusion and chaos to commission. For Jesus commissions the disciples and he begins by saying, peace be with you. Not the peace of the world not the peace of a quiet moment, but the peace of Jesus, which transcends all understanding. In fact, in Philippians 4, you commonly hear Philippians 4, verse 7, this blessing, and may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, this is what Jesus is offering as he comes. He says, peace be with you. My peace, my peace I give to you. It's a calming peace. It's a peace that calms the chaos and confusion of the world. And if you were, it's sort of that intention getter. I can just picture Jesus grabbing their faces and just saying, calm down, peace be with you. Peace be with you. you notice, we can't do anything without Jesus coming to us first, offering his peace second, and then in this commissioning, he says these words, as my Father has sent me, I send you. In the midst of the chaos and confusion, Jesus appears to us, he calms us down, he says, what are you worried about? I have you, I died for you, I spread my arms on the hardwood of the cross so that all this chaos and confusion you can give to me, I've paid the price for you, and without taking a breath, and now I'm sending you out into the world to proclaim that same message. 
Think about that, brothers and sisters. We are not to stay holed up. We are not to stay confined to ourselves. And in this time, we are to be sent. Just as the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus is sending us. And there will come a day when we're going to be able to get outside and actually make contact with people closer than six feet social distancing. But in the meantime, we have a wonderful way that God has provided us through all this technology to connect people, to send, to be sent to them. Because we're not being sent just as messengers. It's not just about us as messengers. It's about us incarnating what Jesus has done. He has loved us before we loved him. And we are to love others as he has loved us. And so it is that we can use our time, our talent, and our treasure to reach out to our neighbors, to reach out to those who are feeling isolated, to reach out to those who don't have the hope of Jesus and proclaim his forgiveness. And that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. We can tell them that Jesus can forgive their sins and by saying, I confess my sins to God, we can confirm to them that Jesus died for those sins and their sins can be forgiven. But if they don't, proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior, well, there's a problem there because they can't pay for, for their sins. I can't pay for their sins. Only Jesus can, and that's the message we are called to proclaim. It's the message that Jesus proclaimed time and time again to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus brings us peace in this commissioning. He gives us a message and notice that the disciples don't realize who Jesus is. They're still kind of confused about this until he does what? Until he shows them his hands. Until he shows them his side. And it's there in this physical resurrected body. I don't think there's actually holes there, but I think the marks that are there are glorious marks saying, I am not just the man you saw nailed to the cross, but I am now the man who has been resurrected as I told you I would. And here I am. See, the glory of my woundedness is now that weakness that you thought was weakness that led to my death is now life eternal for you because of what I have done for you. And in that instant, they recognize who Jesus is. And so we move from confusion and chaos to commission Peace be with you. As my Father has sent me, I send you. And then Jesus consecrates the apostles. He breathes on them. Consecrate means to sanctify. It means to set aside. It means to make holy for a special purpose. And these apostles who will be the foundation of the church, who have walked with Jesus who have heard Jesus, who saw him die, and now see him resurrected, are to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, they're going to receive it in full measure in Acts. But I believe that this initial breathing on by Jesus is preparation for what is about to happen. It's also preparation for them to be apostles. It's also preparation for them for the next 50 days, being ready to be sent out into that community to preach. And as we hear about Jesus breathing on his apostles and saying, receive the Holy Spirit, we can't help but think, go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, as God formed Adam from the dust of the earth and he breathes life into him. I can't help but think of the dry bones in Ezekiel and God breathing life into those dry bones to come to life. And now we have this vision of Jesus breathing into the apostles and during the next 50 days, them growing in those fruits of the Spirit, growing in love, growing in joy, patience, growing in peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, as Paul describes in Galatians, so that when that Pentecost time comes, they are fully, fully filled with the Holy Spirit and instantly we see Peter preach a sermon he could have never preached on his own, a sermon that was fueled by the Holy Spirit. 
Brothers and sisters, as we are in our homes, as we are worshiping together, as Jesus comes into our presence and says, peace be with you, I have a message for you to share with others. Now receive the Holy Spirit. Because without that Holy Spirit, we can do nothing on our own. Nothing on our own. The eyes of the apostles begin to be open and they go back and tell, uh, they, they tell uh, uh, Thomas over and over again, we've seen the Lord, he's risen, he's here all through the week. And all of a sudden we see eight days later in verse 26, I, I'm wondering if they just wore Thomas down or maybe that same Holy Spirit that was given to them through their breath begins to work on Thomas. That should be a lesson for us, that we need to continue to preach, we need to continue to love, we need to continue to press in to our neighbors, to our friends, preaching the gospel at all times. And who knows how the Spirit is working. And we are to incarnate that message. We are to have Christ be seen in our actions. That's the thing that sets us apart from the culture. And we have no great opportunity in our lifetime than what we're going through right now to feed, to love, to do those things that Jesus commanded us to do. And I think that's exactly what the apostles did to Thomas during these next eight days. They loved him as Jesus would loved him, and I think eventually they wore him down, and he finally said, fine, I'll gather with you again. Eight days later, Verse 26, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, you see there's still this process of belief that's happening even with the apostles now. This process of sanctification, the process of the Spirit working in their lives continues on. And even in their brokenness, that Spirit is working to remove the scales from their eyes. I don't know, maybe they locked the doors because that was a prerequisite of Thomas. Thomas, maybe he said, I'll come in, but you got to lock the doors. And maybe they knew that Jesus was going to appear. But one thing we do know, Jesus does appear. Again, without the aid of a door, without the aid of, without the aid of being lowered, in the roof, lowered down from the roof. And he says those words again, peace be with you. Maybe that's a greeting we should carry with us today. Maybe that's a greeting. Maybe that's something anew that we should carry with us during this time of, Lord, what are you trying to teach us in the midst of this coronavirus? And maybe one of them is, we need to start greeting each other with the peace of Jesus. Peace be with you. Seemed to work on the apostles and it seemed to work on Thomas. Maybe it'll work in our world. What do you think? says these words again, gets their attention, peace be with you. And see, the apostles have been commissioned, they've been called, they've been commissioned, they've been consecrated. Every one of them now is called to go out and be an apostle, a messenger of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. But there was one who was missing who needs to have that same commissioning and consecration to be sent, and that's Thomas. And so we sort of get a repeat of this story. Peace be with you. And again, Jesus shows him the glory wounds of his hands and his side. And he says, see, those nails that you saw go in my hand, those pounding of that hammer when you thought, that's it, it's over with, whatever it is that I was going to do, whatever it is that I was believed is gone, it's dead, it's nailed to the cross with Jesus. Jesus says, no, it's not. For what you thought was death is life. Life eternal in me. I have risen from the dead so that you can be with me today and forever. And here I am, Thomas. And notice, Thomas does not touch Jesus. He does not ask for an explanation. He does not ask, how can this be? He doesn't even say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need some time. No. No. For we have this story of commissioning. We have this story of consecration. And now we have a confession. We have the most complete confession of who Jesus is. And it's the simplest creed in the whole Bible. Without batting an eye, Thomas says, 
my Lord and my God. You see, the focus of this story, it's easy to be on the doubting of Thomas. But I believe that's only one side of the story, if you will. Because if we talk about Thomas's doubt, we have to talk about Thomas's confession. If we have to talk about the cross, we have to talk about the sin and Jesus dying for our sin. But we can't just leave it there. We have to talk about the resurrection and the grace that is offered. And here we get the same thing. We have the doubt, the sin, the brokenness. You know, Thomas violated one of the major things that Jesus prayed for in his high priestly prayer, that the disciples would stay together, that they would be unified, but he goes off by himself. When we go off by ourselves, brothers and sisters, we are easy pickings for Satan. If you remember anything from this sermon, it's this. It's that the disciples, the apostles gathered together. Gather together with your family. Don't be alone. And if you start having doubts about what's going on, call somebody, text somebody. Be in fellowship. And as Thomas comes into fellowship, Jesus appears and he has this confession. It's accurate, it's complete, and it's the point of the entire Gospel of John. Jesus is Lord and God. He is Savior. He is the Messiah. It's the point of the entire gospel. And right beneath that, we need to hear Jesus' words. And they're words to you and I this morning. I don't think he said these words other than for us to hear them 2,000 years later. Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen me? Great, I'm glad you believe now. But listen up, church. Listen up, those of you at home watching. Listen to these words. Blessed are those who have not seen but believe. Sounds like a beatitude to me. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5 and Jesus says things like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is a kingdom in heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth blessed are the merciful for they should believe for they shall receive mercy blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe it comes full circle brothers and sisters blessed are you and I this morning not because we have seen but because we have believed not because we have asked for physical evidence not because we want to reach out and touch the wounds but because we know what the wounds of Jesus mean in our life and as we've talked about the seas this morning about confusion and chaos moving to commission and consecration and confession I want to reach the conclusion this morning with the word Continuity, with the word continuity. Brothers and sisters, we have a message to preach, a message that was given to the apostles, a message they preached, they risked their lives for, they gave up their lives for, that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation called the apostolic succession of faith. It's now being delivered to you. You have been cornered, you have been called, and now I am commissioning you, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm praying that you feel consecrated and empowered to share that message with somebody today. That is the job of the church, brothers and sisters. We need to have continuity of that message, continuity of that mission. Our mission is not about staying inside and contained. Our message is our mission is to spread that word connecting to Christ and community. You see, Jesus needs the church. We need to be his hands and feet. And church, we need Jesus. We need his power, we need his authority, we need his spirit that he breathes into us this morning. So let me pray for that. Let me pray for that this morning. If you grab a hand, uh, if you would just sort of follow along with me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we know that you are here amongst us, for you have told us 
When two or three are gathered together, you are in the midst. We hear that peace, Lord, and this week, and even as we face storms this afternoon and tomorrow morning, Lord, we want your peace. We want you to be with us. We want the peace of God. We want your peace with us, Lord. We pray for that. But we also know that you are commissioning us to go out and to spread that word, to love our neighbor as you have loved us to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel message. So send your Holy Spirit now. Church, take a deep breath right now. That breath, breathe it in, breathe in that Holy Spirit and exhale as God sends you out. And may you exhale saying, my Lord and my God. Amen, amen, amen.